In nuke news, radiation levels powerful enough to kill a person in less than an hour. That's what officials have recorded at a small part of the destroyed Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, which melted down over four years ago in the wake of a massive tsunami. As the Japan Times reported, Tokyo Electric Power Company said that radiation levels of up to 9.4 sieverts per hour have been detected near a reactor containment vessel. Checks on September 4th through the 25th found the extremely high radiation levels in a small building containing a pipe that is connected to the reactor number two containment vessel at the plant. Just for perspective, 9.4 sieverts is around 24 times higher than what was recorded back in March of 2011 when the plant first melted down. No, I don't believe it. That just happened. And that raises the question, just how serious is this news out of Fukushima? What does it say about the safety situation at the facility? And how worried should we be about the long-term impact of that disaster? Let's ask Kevin Camps, nuclear waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Thanks Great for having to see me. you. So walk us through this. Uh, what's, what's, how concerning is this news? Well, these radiation levels, as you said, are potentially fatal to humans without radiation shielding at close proximity. Whoa. That's amazing. It's impossible. Is it? Or is it so possible that your head is spinning like a top? So this is outside of containment. This is a room outside of containment. And we've long known that Unit 2 was probably the worst radioactivity releases of all the units. It was Units 1, 2, and 3 that melted down. And inside of these reactor buildings, uh, these huge radiation doses have been measured, so much so that uh, remote-controlled robots sent in to measure radiation, take photographs, take film, break down quickly under this intense gamma radiation. What it's showing is the containments failed to contain. Mm. So fuel has gotten out, at least in you know microscopic form, but it- Get the f out of here. Mm. So fuel has gotten out, at least in you know microscopic form, but- it it's gotten out into the environment, it's gotten out into the atmosphere, into the soil, into the ocean. This is an ongoing catastrophe. Another example of that. Does, is, this, is this any kind of an indication of something that we or the Japanese should be freaked out about in terms of the potential for an explosion, a dirty bomb kind of scenario? Well, we've known since the first days of this thing, as you said, back in March of 2011, that the releases were massive. I mean, it's yeah, been compared. It, it's, it's, it's its own dirty bomb. Yeah, and you know, the closer into the core that has probably entirely melted down, although we don't know. They're saying unit two, maybe a 70% meltdown, mm -hmm. maybe it was 100% meltdown. We have to assume, just to be conservative, that these were 100% meltdowns. And then the question is, where did that molten core go to? Mm -hmm. And so some of it went through this pipe into this room and created these nearly 1,000 rem per hour radiation dose rates, which will kill a person within a half hour on uh, exposure. That's why people can't get in. No, I don't believe it. What it is showing is, you know, this estimate of 40 years to decommission these wrecked reactors. It may be optimistic. The technology doesn't exist. The remote controlled robots are breaking down. That's, these are just monitors. And that's not just true of Fukushima. That's true of any nuclear reactor anywhere in the world that might lose coolant and have a meltdown. Well, we've seen this at Chernobyl where, you know, this new sarcophagus that has yet to be installed has taken all these, you know, it's going on 30 years now. So you can't have people in these situations. They'll be quickly, you know, exposed to lethal doses. Yeah. The Ukrainians are still cleaning up Chernobyl. They've built the largest movable structure in human history that has yet to be moved over the old sarcophagus. And once it is moved over, it's only going to last 100 years, and all it is is for dust suppression, so they can take apart the old sarcophagus before it collapses and creates another Chernobyl release. Wow, wow. Um, it's incredible. Japan recently started a few of their nuclear, restarted a couple of their nuclear reactors. What does that tell us about what's going on in Japan? There's a huge push by the pro nuclear Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, which has ruled the country essentially since World War II. This is Prime Minister Abe's party. That's right. There was a short time period where the Democratic Party of Japan ruled, ironically, when the Fukushima catastrophe started. <laughs> and the pro-nuclear party, the Liberal Democratic Party, is still for nuclear power. So they've got two reactors restarted under these supposedly upgraded safety regulations. And there are, there's a list of others they want to restart. 
But the Japanese anti-nuclear movement, which has grown tremendously since Fukushima began, including Abe's mentor, the former Prime Minister Koizumi, is a part of the anti-nuclear movement now, used wow. to be pro-nuclear. Wow. I mean, the mayor of Futaba, which hosts Fukushima Daiichi, it's now a ghost town, everybody's an evacuee living elsewhere. He was pro-nuclear, of course, before, but since he's an out, you know, outspoken, leading anti-nuclear voice. Right. So they've worked miracles in Japan by keeping most of the reactors shut down for nearly five years now. So we have this radiation in this external building outside of reactor number two, which is clearly stuff coming out of the core inside reactor two. How much of this radiation is still making its way into the ocean every day? And how much of that may be ma making its way into the food chain and into, uh, I mean, here we are. We're, we're east of that. The, the waters flow west to east in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, what are we seeing? There's this incredible figure that every day at Fukushima Daiichi for pretty much the past five years now, there has been a release into the ocean of radioactively contaminated groundwater to the level of 300 to 400 tons per day. And if you convert that to gallons, it's 80,000 to maybe over 100,000 gallons of radioactively contaminated groundwater every day, mm -hmm. day after day. Some days it's a lot worse than that. This site has been inundated by uh, typhoons, for example. Are they basically just slowly washing away the radiation into the Pacific? Is this their strategy? This is a chronic thing. Uh, there are hot spots throughout the complex. There are uh, channels under the reactors. There are sub-basements that are flooded with intensely radioactive water. In addition to that, there's this growing uh, tank farm of these giant tanks that hold a thousand tons each of highly contaminated water. Some of these have leaked their entire contents. That happened one day in the summer of 2013. An entire tank lost its contents to the groundwater, which then flowed out into the ocean. So there are bad days where those releases are even worse. Do we know if any of this stuff is showing up here in the United States? Well, like you said, I mean, what happens when it hits the ocean is not dilution, as the nuclear industry would like people to think. It's actually a bioconcentration, a reconcentration up the food chain. So you have to worry about the seafood supply. Back last spring, April of 2015, is when the plume in the ocean actually began to reach the North American West Coast. It started up in Canada, in Vancouver, British Columbia, and now it's moving south. This is actual physical uh, radioactivity in the ocean water. But I mean, uh, bluefin tuna brought contamination in their flesh with them when they migrated back in August of 2011. It only took them several months to go from the northeast Japanese coastline over to the west coast of North America. Astonishing. Kevin Camps, you guys are doing great work beyond nuclear. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Tom. Great to see you, Kevin. You too. The size of that is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. It's a virtual planetoid! Shh. Has its own weather system! Shh. But we do know this. We know who makes this engine run. It's you people. You glorious bastards. You valiant watchers of the videos. And to you, we wanted to say... I don't think that I thanked you ever for what you've done for me. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Daddy. I love you. Hey, Luke, thanks. Thanks for coming after me. It's just basic chemistry, but thank you, Jesse. I'm glad. Thank you. I love you. You? Complete me. You kept me honest. You made me a whole person. I owe you everything. Thank you for doing this, Ellen. No, seriously, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you.